For the Lord, He is great and He's worthy to be praised. Magnify Him and lift Him up. For one reason tonight, to lift up the name of Jesus, because there's no other name like Jesus on this earth or in heaven above, whereby we can be saved. I wish somebody could hear me tonight. I said there's no other name on this earth or in heaven. to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me I took back what he stole from me Oh, yes. 
Goodness and what is done for me. Bless you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. You're so good, Lord Jesus. We're here tonight because of you, Lord, and only because of you. Because of your name and your grace, Jesus. Your power still saves. You're still able to heal, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I praise you. Come on, lift up your voices and praise him. Bless you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. Oh, oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. mountains and the field your river flows with love for me and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth 
And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever Yes, I could, Lord, I could sing Sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing, I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the hills, your river flows with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing Feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when this old world has seen the lights, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I can sing of your love for. Sing of your love forever. Jesus. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love. Sing of your love, Jesus. Sing of your great of love, Jesus, that you have for us, that you would lay down your life, lay down your life for us, Lord. I never get tired of singing your praises, cause you've been so faithful, Lord, so faithful, Lord. You're faithful. Want to tell you, Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful. Could thank you forever for lifting me up, Jesus, for making me a son, for forgiving all my sin, for your blood and your life that you've given for me. Sing of it forever, Lord. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Oh, I could sing of your love forever. Oh, I could sing of it, Lord. I could sing of your love
love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise you. I love you, Jesus. Could never say enough, Lord Jesus. I love you. I love you, Jesus. With all of my heart, Jesus, I love you. I worship you because you're faithful, Lord. You're faithful when I'm faithless. You never give up. Mm, thank you, Lord. Just want to thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Father God, I lay before you my life, my heart, my being, all that I am. Spend me for your glory, my Lord. I want to bring honor to your name. Make me your servant. Your willing servant. Longing just to be Lord, everything I am, Jesus, is yours, Jesus. I give up all rights to my life, Lord. I 
give up rights, Lord, because they belong to you. Because you bought me. You paid for me. You gave your blood to set me free. because of you and I'm yours I'm yours I'm yours I'm yours Thank you, Lord. I'm not done yet. Last night, as we were worshiping the Lord at the end of the service, you see, I grew up in church where if you basically three chord songs is all we sang because nobody else could play the fourth chord. And you know, the Lord was pleased with that. But there was a longing in my life to always sing the hymns of the church. And I knew just over in the glory land didn't qualify as a hymn. I could sing it though. So last night, I make myself real vulnerable in front of everybody here. I've never played this song before last night, but it was in my spirit. And I, in this revival, those of you who are music directors and you feel like sometimes everything's just gotta be rehearsed to death, I believe you should rehearse and be prepared, and if you can't fly real by the seat of your pants, then you better make sure that uh, you've got a list to go by, but sometimes the Spirit of the Lord told me three weeks into this revival not to ever make a list. Now, I'd never done that in my life. I always went to church with my little list and my chords and all my musicians knew what key I was in. The Spirit of the Lord said, don't do that because I want to guide you and embarrass you. So last night, I just felt like I wanted to sing this song. So that's how I learn new songs. Whatever I feel the Spirit of the Lord wants us to sing, I just, Steve, just take off. So I've never done this one before, and it's not new. It was written in 1816, so that's not new. All you real musicians, don't laugh at me. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but 
its own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity I like that. Crown him the Son of God before the worlds began. And he who I can't see that far. We got some good Methodists here that know this. Who every grief has known. Works better down here. This is my favorite verse. Here we go. Now, can we do it with a little more soul than that? It sounded a little too Methodist here. Matter of fact, it sounded a little too Assembly of God, too. There we go. I don't know if we can maintain that, though. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Rich unions with visible above. In beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You reign over everything. Everything is under your feet. The Lord our God, the Almighty reign. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reign. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reign. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reign. Hallelujah. Say.
One more time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you love Jesus, give him a good hand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Welcome to revival. Turn around and shake hands with about three people, if you would, before you're seated. Make them welcome tonight.
Friday. Um, everyone remain standing just for a minute. I, I want the, the youth choir to do that one more time. But um, I had a, a dream recently, on, uh, and this is for somebody here. You, you live in a major city, okay? And uh, in this dream, there were skyscrapers everywhere. It could have been Dallas. It could have been Minneapolis. It was, it was a larger city in the United States. It could have been Houston. And um, in this dream, this, this, I had this dream within the last 24 hours. Um, there was, a, there was a, a, a tempest, a wind that started blowing and it was so unusual in the city. People were gawking at this wind, and it started, it, it started to turn into a, like a tornado. And it was so unusual for it to be coming through the center of this city. And I saw somebody, somebody here at this revival. Uh, this, was a, this, was a, this was a storm that was coming your way. And it's a personal thing that you've gone through. You're going through it right now. And when it, it hit the apartment, the place I was in, I was in one of those skyscrapers. And when it hit, it blew all the windows out. And I was, I was behind a couch. And the glass was flying everywhere. And it was just the, the whole inside of the place seemed to get destroyed. But I was unharmed. And there's someone else in the room with me. I don't know who it was. But they were unharmed too. And then there was a great calm. And we looked around, and it was just perfectly still. And then the wind picked up again. It's like the eye of the hurricane. Then it came through again. And the second wave was worse than the first wave. And it, more things were destroyed around me, but I was not harmed. Nothing happened to me, and nothing happened to you. And the Lord spoke to me. I woke up, and he spoke to me to tell you this, that although you're going through something difficult right now, it, it may seem like it's just uh, horrendous and you're not going to make it through it. You're going to make it through it. And there could be a time of calm and then something even worse seems to happen to you. You're going to make it through that too. And you're going to come out on the other side. Listen, this is a word from the Lord. Everything's going to be fine. God's going to work it out. He knows what's going on. I remember getting up in the room, and I was so thrilled that nothing happened. It was okay. Everything was fine. And the Lord told me to tell somebody that here. The Lord is watching what's going on in your life. He knows you're going through a storm. He knows you're going through a difficulty, but you're going to come out unharmed. The things can be fixed. Okay, that's not the situation. The things can be fixed. And it may be, that may have been your, that may have been your husband and your wife in that room. And all hell is coming against your marriage. And maybe it comes against your marriage twice. And you feel like it's all going to be destroyed. Wrong, friend. It is not going to be destroyed. You're going to come out okay. It's just a battle and you're going to come through it. I want this choir. Keep in mind, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Why does he allow these things to happen, Brother Steve? I don't know, friend. I've been through so, so many storms. How many have been through storms? I've been through so many battles in the Christian life, and they come one after another. How many know what I'm talking about? It's nonstop, but you survive. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. You're going to make it through. Sing this again. I want everyone to worship the Lord. Everything's going to work out, friend. It's going to be okay.
can be seated. He's faithful, isn't he? I want to just talk to you for a little while about a foundational key to ongoing revival. Those of you in ministry, those of you not in ministry, these are important principles to take hold of. I was talking to someone about different renewal movements in the body and some things that I would characterize as more refreshing and not so much revival. And someone said, yeah, well, those meetings emphasize the joy a lot, and I guess in Brownsville you emphasize repentance, as if repentance and joy were opposite ends, as if if you emphasize repentance, you wouldn't have much joy. You know, as if down here, when you'd come into a meeting, we'd basically give out gowns to everybody, like mourner's gowns, if you came in, you know, if you were worshiping on the line and smiling, we'd say, what are you doing? We're about repentance here. When you walk in, the ushers glare at you until you kind of hang your head. And they said, that's more appropriate for the house of God. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the deeper the repentance, the higher the joy. The deeper the repentance, the longer lasting the joy, and the more real the joy. In fact, one of the specific things that's, that the Word says brings joy to heaven is repentance of sinners. One of the guaranteed ways to make the angels rejoice and God Himself rejoice is to see people turning from their sins and being born again. That brings joy into the very presence of God. Think of it. And see, when people shake off the bondages, shake off the guilty conscience, shake off the alienation from God, when they know they're right with their Father, when they love Him with a pure heart, you better believe there's joy. And when there's an open heaven, when our sin is not being like a cloud over us, when there's not all kinds of demonic interference because we're playing games with the devil, when heaven's open, you better believe God's pouring out joy upon His people. And in fact, the places I have been that have preached a life-giving repentance message, not just negative, browbeating, condemning with no hope, with no way out, with no salvation, with no forgiveness, just legalistic bondage. No, I'm talking about places that have preached a life-giving repentance message. They have been the most joyous places I've ever been. I want to encourage you not to be afraid of God's knife. You know, if you have a serious heart condition, do you want to go to a doctor who's going to give you a pretty Band-Aid, maybe one of those Band-Aids they make for kids with lots of different colors and flowers and things? We have a special Band-Aid for you, sir. And we're going to put it right here over your heart. Do you want that? And then you die six months later with that pretty Band-Aid on you? Feeling sicker and weaker all the time? Or do you want someone who's going to say to you, sir, I'm a specialist. I've performed open heart surgery on this very case. It's serious surgery, but I can do it. You need to do this. You need to be hospitalized. You need to go through this kind of rehab. But if you will let me put you under the knife, you can live 30 more years completely healthy. In fact, you'll feel better after the surgery than before. That's the kind of doctor you want. I mean, barring miraculous healing. Just get my point. How many were here last night when I told the unforgettable story about uh, my finger? What story was that? I was here last night, but I don't remember that story. Well, good for you. It wasn't unfree. Was it last night that I, those pearls of wisdom? Or it, it just, it could have been last year. You know what it is, though? It's one of those timeless things that is just so awesome you can't quite even put it in a place. Timeless, yeah, timeless truths. I'm just a treasure trove of timeless truths. But uh, I was talking about how this guy wanted to grow my legs to heal my finger, if you remember that. And when I finally got surgery, they didn't know exactly how long the surgery would last. I was conscious through the surgery because I had to teach later that day, and I told them I couldn't be completely put under. And as the surgery wore on, there was some discomfort attached to it that started to get pretty serious, and I'm wondering how long is this thing going to go on? And the problem was that the ligaments were the thing that were, they had frozen in such a way that my finger froze like this, and they thought it would be pretty easy. You know, they got in there, it had been 11, 12 years before I had this thing operated on, and 
They worked on it and 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 worked on it worked on it. He kept cutting the wood. No, that didn't do it. Try it. No, that didn't do it. He was wondering how many ligaments is he going to have to cut away? And he finally got to the last one and then the finger opened up. What's the use of coming this far and letting God get three quarters of the way to the root of the problem and then leaving with the root of the problem? What would, the use, what would the use have been if I said, look, look, doc, I got to teach. It's getting late. My arm is, you know, it's this, hurt, this whole thing's hurting. Tell you what, you did a good job. You tried hard. You got 80% of the way. There's blood. There's all that. It shows you did something. Stitch me up. I got to get out of here. What a fool I would have been. Friend, you'd be more of a fool to let God start the surgery on you and then draw back because the knife's getting a little deep. Because the repentance is getting a little too personal. God, I don't mind dealing with this sin. I don't mind dealing with this sin, but not that sin. Not my Isaac. God's saying, lay it all down. Don't draw back from the surgeon's knife because he's not out to hurt you. He's out to heal you. He's not out to destroy you. He's out to deliver you. He wants to make your life in him more abundant, more full, so that your life can be a conduit of blessing to others. Have you ever done something wrong, just some silly little thing, maybe as a kid you did it and you try to cover it up, you don't want anybody to know, but you know it's going to be found out? You try, and the more you try to cover it up, the worse it gets. And you, you know, the person comes home, maybe you're a kid and you broke something and you hope your parents won't see it. I see some grins from some little kids here. If you haven't repented of it, the altars will be open in a little while. And that person comes home, they're all smiles, but you're like... Or maybe that urgent thing that your spouse asked you to please do and you assured her, you assured him you'd do it, and you didn't do it. And now you've got to look him in the eye or something really serious, something really wrong. Ugly. Sin. Man, your conscience isn't clear. They're fine, but you can't even look them in the eyes. And that's how some of you live your lives before God. You can only get so far, and then that thing comes up. That one area, that one sin, that one issue, that one unresolved thing, and it's standing in the way of open heaven. It's standing in the way of unhindered fellowship with God. Let God put the knife to it. Let God get to the very core of it. Let him scoop way down deep and get rid of all the crud and all the junk so you can just say, Lord, my hands are clean and my heart is pure. And as the hymnist said, there's nothing between me and my Savior. I was talking a session recently and made reference to the refiner's fire in yesterday's day session talking about Malachi 3 and God coming as a refiner's fire in revival. Steve's talked some about working around the metallurgy and things are melted down in the terrific heat. A woman came up to me and she said, have you ever been in a refinery? I said, no, I haven't. I mean, I've, been in the, I've lived in a refinery for a while, but she meant a real refinery, not a spiritual one. You know, I've been in God's refinery many times. But no, I'd never been in an actual refinery. She said, well, my husband works in a gold refinery. And she said, I think it's 2,000 degrees that the, the thing gets heated up to. And, you know, you wear a protective mask and you wear a protective coat. And she said, when you stand back, there's, there's a glass you can watch things through. And you can actually feel the heat through that glass as you're standing back there. And she said, God showed her husband, gave him a vision. And showed him, when you come into the presence of God, who's a refiner's fire, God said, you got to take the mask off and you got to take the coat off. Get exposed to the searing heat of God's presence. It'll remove the impurities. Let it hurt. Let it go down deep. Let it reduce you to your knees where you say, God, unless you have mercy on me, it's all over. And then he can do a complete work. So let me urge you. Let me encourage you. Don't leave here until repentance has done its work in your life. Repentance prepares the way for the presence of the Lord, for the coming of the Lord. It was Frank Barlaman in Azusa Street who said that the depth of any revival will be determined by the spirit of repentance that is obtained. How deeply will you let God work in your life? How deeply will you let him search your very motives? To that extent, he can own you. To that extent, his love and joy and blessing can flow through you. To that extent, no more guilt, no more condemnation, no more weight on your back, nothing holding you down. Don't be afraid of the knife. Look, this, this finger works well. Isn't that exciting? You know, if I got up from that table prematurely, it'd still be frozen and I'd be a jerk. 
Thank God I let the doctor finish his work. Let him finish his work in your life tonight. You will never, ever regret it. Amen? One quick announcement for you. We have our pastor's conference, our leader's conference this coming week, but revival services go on as always, okay? So if you're local or if you know folks that are planning on coming or if you were thinking of staying over, by all means do it. In fact, we limit the pastor's conference to 1,500, and uh, that's specifically so that others are able to get in. In fact, in the night services, we don't allow everyone in the main sanctuary so that others can get into the main sanctuary also. In other words, we don't allow all the leaders in here, even though they've come from around the world, because we, we want to make sure that everyone can get in, everyone can be ministered to. The only difference in schedule is prayer meeting is not Tuesday night this week. Students at school remember this. Prayer meeting is Monday night this week. And then our normal service is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning this coming week. So you're all welcome. If you won't be here, pray for God's Spirit to fall powerfully on the minister's conference. Amen. God bless you. We're going to take a, about three quick testimonies, and um, uh, I already have one testimony. Uh, so if uh, Shay Hughes is here, if you'll come uh, forward right now, we'd appreciate that. Uh, the testimonies that we're going to take, the other two, uh, they, uh, we, we want them to be relative to the revival, what has happened here. And so if God has done something in your life or in your church, we'd really like to hear from some pastors. If God's moving in your church as a result of, uh, of the ministry of the revival here, we'd like to hear about that. So um, those of you that, uh, and obviously we can't let everybody testify, we're going to take two, so don't get angry with me if we don't, don't pick you. But if you have a testimony that's relative to the revival and you'd like to share it real quickly, would you raise your hand right now so that, um, that uh, we could have someone, maybe I intimidated everybody. Did I? <laughs> okay. Okay, right in the back, back there. Come on up, brother, and I'll take you right there. Okay? Okay, this is uh, Shay Hughes. He's a um, student at Lee College in, um, in Cleveland, Tennessee. And um, he just told me a remarkable testimony of something God did in his life and then confirmed it when he came down here a couple of weeks ago. So, Shay, tell us about that real quickly. Um, like I said, I'm from Lee College, and I'm a pastoral ministries major there. Uh, last May, I was in my dorm room studying for exams, and something happened that will forever change my life. I felt this presence come into my room. And it's not like any presence I've ever felt in my life. I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, but it wasn't the fire that I felt. But it was the most remarkable peace and power I've ever felt in my life. And at that exact moment, I fell on my knees and I began to pray. And as I began to pray, I began to see things. And it scared me, so I stopped. But God pulled me again and he said, pray. And as I prayed, this is what I saw when I prayed. I saw this huge white cloud, the most purest cloud you've ever seen in your entire life but it was a restless cloud. And I felt this presence pull me towards the cloud and it was above a church. And as I approached the front of the church, I heard the most awesome thunder that you, you have ever heard in your entire life. It literally shook my entire being from head to toe. And my first instinct was to look up at the cloud, but it wasn't coming from the cloud. At that exact moment, the church doors came open and the saints of the church walked out and the thunder was coming from their footsteps. And it was literally shaking the very foundations of hell with every footstep that they took. As they walked out into the yard of the church, I began to feel something run down the back of my neck. And I looked down at my arm and my arm began to blaze with fire. And I looked around me and the people around me began to blaze with fire. And I looked up at the cloud and it wasn't rain that was coming out of the cloud, but it was droplets of fire and it literally consumed my body and the people that were standing around me. I looked back up at the cloud and the cloud left and God spoke to me and told me to follow the cloud. I went home this summer, I helped my uncle play in a church, had a great summer in the Lord and my life did not change until I come back here two weeks ago. And I came here on Friday night and Brother Hill prayed for me and my family and we left and we were just overjoyed. But when I walked down in the parking lot, my life took a 360 degree change because God literally pecked me on the shoulder. When I turned around, I seen the cloud sitting above this church. And God said, you come and tell them. And I said, God, I don't understand. What should I tell them? And God said, you tell them this. He said, you tell them that the thunder 
that you heard is the power that I'll give them and that they'll shake the foundations of hell with every footstep they take. He said, you tell them the fire that you saw is a fire that I'm going to rain down on their bodies and they're going to take it back to their school systems. They're going to take it back to their workplace. They're going to take it back to their countries. I'm telling you, you're going to go to the enemy's camp tonight and you're going to shake hell with every footstep of the way. God is pouring out his spirit. God is raising up young people all across America. And I've got one more year left at Lee University and I just feel like I had my whole life planned, but I feel like God has called me here to this school of ministry. I don't know why, but I've got the cloud in my vision, and I'll never let it out of my sights again. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise God. Tell us where you're from, brother, and who your from, what your name is. I'm Garrett Miles from Lakeland, Florida. Okay. Um, last night, I was over there, and... I began to worship and the praise team came out and I began to dance before the Lord and I've been saved for 11 years but it just felt like chains were just falling off of me because I've never danced that freely before and I realized that in my own church we're going through a, a revival we've sent a lot of people up here to this revival and they've come back and it's really just transformed our church but I realized that before the revival in our own church that we were living in the Old Testament in, a, in the way that we were coming in and we looked for the priests, the musicians, and the pastor to go get some of God and bring it to us and deliver it to us. And we never walked through the veil that was rent in two. We just, we lived in the Old Testament in our church. And when I began to understand sort of what was going on, I read in the Bible where Jesus was in the garden and the men came to kill him, the officers, and they had swords and torches. And when they came to kill him, he said, Whom seekest ye? And they said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And the Bible says they fell to the ground, fell over backwards. Some say they fall, fell to their knee. But I realized that you need to ask yourself the question when you go to church, who are you seeking? Are you seeking a certain song? Are you seeking a certain message? Or are you going to walk into the Holy of Holies yourself and begin to worship God? It really doesn't matter what song's being played. You should worship if, if the drummer doesn't show up or if the musicians don't show up. Yeah, come on. The veil was rent in two for us to walk into the Holy of Holies with boldness and authority. You know, if you took your closet in your house of your clothes, you could literally separate each of your clothes to the roles that you play when you wear them. You could put your clothes of a friend here, your clothes of a husband here, your clothes of a worker on your job. You could separate your clothes like that. And I realized last night that the next time I go to church, I'm not going to put on church clothes. And the next time the devil attacks me, I'm not going to just put on regular clothes. I'm going to go in my closet and I'm going to put on the garment of praise. Yeah. And I'm going to come into the Holy of Holies and I'm going to worship next time I'm attacked. I'm going to praise God and I'm going to worship the Lord. And I'm going to have a freedom and a liberty to worship the Lord. And I'm stepping into the New Testament and I'm stepping into the Holy of Holies. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Hey, Pastor. God bless you, How you doing? Dad? I'm doing fine. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Thomas Smith. I'm an associate pastor at United Christian Fellowship Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And uh, right. praise the Lord. And um, I guess it was a few weeks ago that uh, another pastor, Michael Thomas, who's back there, who came with me, uh, gave me uh, John Kilpatrick's book on the brass over the heavens. And uh, I began to read it. And I know that the Lord had been dealing with me a few weeks prior to that, probably about a month up before I read the book concerning fasting and praying and repentance and getting in the will of God. And um, God began to stir my heart before I read the book concerning the same things that I found in the book. And I began to express it to my senior pastor and to the uh, elders at the church. And it began to just spread throughout the whole church. And uh, when I told the pastor I would like to come down this weekend because I had been trying to come down for about a year and a half. And each time that I tried to come, 
God didn't never give me an okay to come. And Brother Mike called me and asked me would I come this time. And instantly I told him yes. And I knew that what was taking place at our church was just the beginning of what was going to happen. Because about, I guess it was about two weeks ago, I was at the Promise Keepers Regional Meeting in Lake Charles at the Lakewood Church. And I was asked to speak and I shared a vision the Lord had shown me the week while I was reading Pastor Kilpatrick's book. And the vision that I saw was a red mantle without sleeves, a very hairy coat-like thing. And I saw God's hand let it go. And it was falling over the city of Lake Charles. And it was before the, it was below heaven, but it was above the earth, and it had not yet touched the earth. But God said, because you have cried out for it, I have let it go. But because it has not landed in your time, you have turned from me. Now, I require with fasting and praying that you seek my face. And our whole church has turned to fasting and praying. Some people who had only fasted one day, God has called them to 21-day water fast, and they have gone through them, and they are in the midst of them. And God is blessing our church. Praise God. He is touching our ministry. I mean, what was dead is now alive. Yes. And God is moving by His Spirit there. And we believe, Pastor Hill, that, Evangelist Hill, that, the gambling boats that are in Lake Charles, that God has dropped that mantle for us to end that thing yeah. because that is not of God. Yeah. But God is going to show himself strong in Lake Charles yeah. because he has some warriors there who are willing to turn from the world and turn towards God as Hezekiah did yeah. and repent of our sins and do the will of God. And I just want to say praise the Lord. Thank Amen. you. Amen. God, God bless you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just encourage all of the AG people here. Be sure and get the uh, November 16th uh, edition of the Pentecostal Evangel. And if you're here from another church and you uh, are not uh, from the Assemblies of God, you can order uh, copies of those from uh, 1445 Boonville Avenue in Springfield, Missouri. And those, uh, that evangel is completely chucked full of reports of revivals across, uh, that are going on across the land right now. And uh, while it's in a, an Assemblies of God publication, as I read each one of those articles, here's what it said. It said that, that revival was coming to those places and came to those places because uh, ministers of all denominations dropped their, their denominational barriers and got together and began to pray and intercede and to seek the face of God. And as they began to do that, the revival fires began to fall in those areas, and it will encourage you greatly. Some of those churches are humongous churches. Some of them in there that are reported on are small churches, but I just want to to tell you and encourage you tonight that God is ready to pour his spirit out. Get ready, get ready, get ready. As T.D. Jake says, get ready. God's getting ready to do something great and you can be a part of it. Hallelujah. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. I send you to the poor to bind up the broken heart and to bring freedom to the captives and release the ones in darkness. i 
upon us because he has anointed us to preach you Lord we bless you Lord we bless you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord holy worthy holy
want you to remain standing. Everyone in the chapel, please stand. Those of you at home, Lyndall, that song that I talked to you just a minute ago about, if you could just sing maybe a, a verse in the chorus, maybe a couple verses of that. No matter what you're going back to the dream I was sharing just a few minutes ago, no matter what you're going through, friend, God is there. I remember when we graduated from uh, Bible school, Dave Wilkerson preached the, um, the message at graduation, and it was entitled, Thou Shalt Have Spells. And um, we were ready to take on the world, and I was ready to hear a message on, you know, onward Christian soldiers, take the world for Christ, you know, something to really lift us up. And he preached, Thou Shalt Have Spells. And he basically said, Get ready, soldiers, you're going to go through some hell. It was the best message he could have ever preached. Yeah. Best thing he could ever preach. And Lynn, just, if you'd play this, just sing it. This is going to minister to hundreds of people right now. If the world from you withholds all of its silver and its gold and you have to get along on meager fare just remember in his word how he feeds the little birds and take your burden to the lord and leave it there and if your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain and your soul is sinking in despair Jesus knows the way you feel. He can save and he can heal. Take your burden to the Lord. Leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Sing that chorus just one more time, man. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Just and never doubt, he will surely bring you out and take your burden to the Lord. Leave it there. How many will take that as a word from the Lord tonight? No matter what it is, friend. When this revival broke out. And we just kept cruising along with it, and then it started getting national media attention. And, and I mean, friend, we're scrutinized for everything, and people will lie about you. They'll say all kinds of stuff. I mean, they, pastors, just remember, when, when revival breaks out, just get ready for all that kind of stuff. I never answer a word of criticism, never have. And there's been people out there that have called me every name in the book. They hate me. They hate John Kilpatrick. They call us liars. And I remember one, one particular time where somebody was spreading lies. They called, it was a paper all over America called The Lies of Steve Hill. And it was naming all these things that happened in the revival that they said wasn't true. And every one of them that they listed were all true. They really happened in the revival. But because these people weren't here, they didn't see it. They figured they were all lies. And they said, we've done all the research and we believe that never happened, for example. One night, a squad car pulled up and dropped some people off and told them to get into the revival. A police car pulled up. Ushers were there. They saw it. You know, it's one of those things that just happened. And I shared that in the revival meeting, and it came out all over America, you know, that that was a lie, that a squad car never pulled up because a person called the police station. They said, did you ever take some, some, some people to the revival? Did you drop them off at the revival? Well, I doubt if any policeman is going to, you know, turn himself into the chief of police and say, listen, I just want you to know, you know, I've been taking people to the revival, you know? 
So they call it the lies of Steve Hill. And then and, and another one was uh, uh, Steve Hill says that the crime rate, the juvenile crime rate is down all over Escambia County. Well, that came out in the local paper. You know, that's all fact. But they said, that's a lie. It's not down. And I remember that, you know, and that went to thousands, tens of thousands of people all over America. And what you want to do, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to rise up and you want to, you, you want to make everything right. And you can't do that, friend. There's no time for that. God will vindicate himself. He'll take care of it, friend, himself. The truth, the truth will always win in the end. Don't ever forget that. And it may take a while. It may be heaven itself that determines the truth. But it'll always win in the end. So learn to just pour it out to the Lord, give it to him, and go on with God. I want everyone here to pray a prayer. We've been praying since Father's Day. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. And I know for a fact there's people here tonight that you don't want to be here. Uh, somebody brought you here and somebody made you to come. Maybe your wife said to you, this is it, baby. You know, if you don't get saved, it's over. And, and so, or, you know, uh, we've heard the stories, friend. We've had people paid to come here. We've had a, one, one couple bought their son a car if he would come. And how many would come if somebody bought you a car? <laughs> but maybe that's why you're here. You know, you, your, your dad said he'd buy you a new pair of jeans if you'd just go to the revival. But you're here, God brought you here, and it doesn't matter how you got here, you're supposed to be here. You are supposed to be here, friend. I want everyone to pray with me right now. Out loud, we're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Everyone together in the chapel, this room, and in the other, in, in homes, those of you in your cars, pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name. in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is a precious service tonight, friends. Something's going on here. I love what's going on in America. Today, um, Doug Hawks, um, who works in our research department, he works on Saturdays, and, and I'm always in the office all day Saturday preparing my message. And um, Doug brings me in a, uh, a, a photocopy of Forbes magazine. Now, that's a business magazine. How many are familiar with Forbes? You know, it's just a business magazine. And in there, there's two pages on the Spirit of God. On the power. Now, this is a business magazine. It's all about the Alpha Course that's come out of the Anglican Church, Holy Trinity Brompton. But it talks about what's going on in New York City at an Episcopalian church where the power of God's coming down. People are praying with one another, laying hands on one another. This is Forbes magazine, okay? What on earth are they talking about Jesus for? I want to tell you why. Because America's ready to hear about Jesus. They want to know more about him. They want to know what's going on. They want a touch from God. So um, I just, man, we just get so much of that stuff in. It's amazing how Jesus is being covered by the media right now. But this is a, mag this is a, um, a typical, you know, Sunday flyer that you'd get into your, in your, um, in your uh, newspaper. And here's a, you know, ratchet socket set for $19.99 and some Edelbrock Performer IAS shock absorbers for $79.99 and a nylon car cover for $21.99. And, and here's a custom uh, two-ton portable floor jack for $19.99. Here's a halogen work light for nine, good, some good bargains. And right on the front is some what would Jesus do bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going... <laughs> you know, you look at them, and it looks like, it looks like, you know, colored fan belts or something. Then you go, you know, what's wrong with this picture, you know? Discount auto parts. What would Jesus do, bracelets? You know? It's like, mechanic, put them on. Don't cusp when you're working on your car, you know? With... <laughs> We're seeing things happen now, friend, in America that never in a million years, 10 years ago, forget it. But right now, you look at the coverage just this year, 
the programs that have been on, the, the, the media coverage, the, the magazines that have covered revival, that have covered the move of God, that have covered prayer, and then stuff like this. You know, something is going on in this country. These are great days, friend. This is so cool. And the guy that got this flyer in the mail, he called him up and they had sold out immediately, all right? <laughs> they, had plenty, they had plenty of halogen work lights and, you know, and car, and, and car shocks and, and nylon car covers, but they, show, they sold out of the Jesus bracelets. So uh, what a day. What a day we're living in. Man. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Everyone that needs to cough, let's go ahead and do that now. <laughs> I was... I was at a cantata in, in, in uh, Mobile a couple years ago. You know, of a huge, uh, matter of fact, it's Cottage Hill Baptist, a great cantata, great church. And this is when Fred Wolf was pastoring there. He invited us to come be, you know, be a part. And, and I sat up there and, and it, was so, it was so quiet, okay? There's, I guess, four or 5,000 people there. And a kid right down from me went, <coughs> and then someone else went, <coughs> And then the place erupted in coughing. It's like, and I said, baby, listen to this. It sounded like a hospital. But get it out of your system, okay? <laughs> That's what was happening just then. I don't know if you heard it, but... Um... <laughs> well... Luke 13, don't feel bad if you cough. Go ahead and go ahead, we'll wait. <clears throat> See, it's the power of suggestion. That's how we operate here, friend. In a few minutes, everyone's going to fall under the power. <laughs> it's so funny how you'll have your, your, your Christians that are just so stuck in the mud. They can't stand anything that has to do with movement, you know, and, and um, so all this falling under the power just can't be gone. So they say this mind control, the power of suggestion. And then we have the secular media comes in. Just, you know, cool cats, they come in just walking around going, you know, and I had one from a major magazine walk with me through here, and, you know, he, 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 he had heard that it was the power of suggestion and mass hypnosis, and it didn't take him 30 seconds. I'm talking about a guy that didn't have a stick of religion or a stick of Jesus in him. He didn't know the Lord nothing. You know, but he had been around hypnosis and stuff, and he was walking around and he was watching people that were behind us being hit by the power. And about right here, there was a man facing opposite of me, and I was walking this way, and I turned around and put my hand on his shoulder. He didn't even know we were walking by, friend. And the power of God swept all over him. He hit the ground, and the guy from the magazine goes, This ain't mass hypnosis. <laughs> this ain't, and this ain't the power of suggestion. <laughs> And I said, I said, I'll tell you what it is. It's God. God's coming down. He sees everybody coming like Jesus saw the woman with the issue of blood. He knows if you're hungry and he'll touch your life. Luke 13, 23. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter in by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Now, these are, this is in red, friend. This is the Lord's red pen here. Verse 26, then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. This is religion. Is anybody listening? This is religion. 
But Lord, we went to the cantatas. We had the singing Christmas tree. You taught in our streets, and he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being cast out. And they will come from east and west and from the north and the south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Now turn with me a few pages before that to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. We're going to read 14 verses. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. One last scripture, Matthew 27. Verse 22, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? This is entitled, The Balls in Your Court. The Balls in Your Court. I remember first hearing this scripture when I became a, a Christian. I had a hard time understanding it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. When I heard someone say that there are only a few chosen, the chosen few, I don't know, Jim, uh, you're from Huntsville. I don't know if you remember Pat and Chris Cushwa and Larry Byram. Uh, Pat Kushwa and, Le and uh, Chris Kushwa, Pat was a lead guitarist and Chris was a drummer. And they were some of the finest musicians that I'd ever heard in my life. We were in a rock band, but didn't come close to the Kushwa brothers. And they had, they had a third member in their band, called, his name was Larry Byram, he played the keyboards. Chris played the drums, Pat played the guitar, and I believe Larry Byram's younger brother played the bass. And they had a band called The Chosen Few. It was not a Christian band. And I remember when I went to one of the parties where this band was playing, and I heard their name, I thought, and, and I was a heathen, I thought, what an egotistical name. As a heathen, I thought that, you know, The Chosen Few. Like, who do you think you guys are? You know, something special like The Special Ones, or The, rest, the Best of the Rest, or The Cream of the Crop. The chosen few. By the way, I'm going to say something to the Kushwa brothers because these tapes go all over the world and they will probably get this and so will you, Larry. I have not seen Pat or Chris and you know Pat, Chris, I have not seen you in, what, 25 years? And Larry, I know you left the chosen few and you went on and uh, became a very successful musician. As a matter of fact, you teamed up with Steppenwolf, and you became their P 
pianist, their keyboard player. And I lost track of you after Steppenwolf. I don't know what happened to you after that. And Pat and Chris, I know you went on to California. You left Huntsville and you formed a band called Rachel. And you achieved a measure of success, but I lost track of you after that. But I just wanted to let you know something. You guys had a band called The Chosen Few. Somebody got this tape to you, or you're listening on radio. Somehow it's gotten into your hands. That band that you had together 25, 28 years ago can be prophetic. Because the Lord is going to speak to you right now. And you can be part of the true chosen few. You can be part of the ones that the Lord looks down on the face of this earth and says, I have chosen you, Pat Kushwa. I have chosen you, Chris Kushwa. I have chosen you, Larry Byram, and you can come into his kingdom. I want you to listen to this message. I know God's got it to you for a purpose. I want you to pay attention. Hallelujah. Boy, I felt that, man. Many of you know that the, um, the tape on the arrows of the Lord, you've seen that, and on the tape we talked to Ted Nugent. And Ted Nugent was one of my heroes back in the 60s. He was a great rock and roller. And now he, oh, he still does his concerts every now and then, but now he owns a bow hunting company. And uh, he makes arrows. And I used his arrows. I went to a hunting store and asked them. I told them I wanted some of the sharpest, the finest arrows to preach a message on the arrows of the Lord. The Bible says, and I told the guy at the, the store, I said, the Bible says his arrows are sharp, they strike like lightning, and they stick fast. That's a good sermon, pastors, to preach. I mean, those are three good points. If you like three pointers, his arrows are sharp, they strike like lightning, and they stick fast. And the guy at the hunting store, he said, you want some of Nugent's arrows. And so he gave, sold me some of Nugent's arrows. And I remember touching my finger to him. And friend, they were sharp. They were razor sharp. And on the video on uh, Arrows of the Lord, I spoke to Ted Nugent. And uh, him being one of my old heroes. I've got a new set of heroes now. But um, I got word the other day, and I hope this is true, Ted. I got word the other day, someone called me and they run a Christian school and they said Ted Nugent had just pulled up and enrolled his kids in a Christian school. So that's cool. But maybe, Ted, you need to come to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. There's room for you. Hallelujah. The ball's in your court. A few easy to understand points tonight, friend. I told Mike this is not going to be a deep message like all my other messages. This is, going to, this is going to be simple, easy to understand. Friend, if you're looking for something deep, you're looking to the wrong person, friend. I'm just, you try to get up every morning and get deep. You know, I just, I, I say, Jesus, just speak, 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 you know. Just speak to my heart. And the, the beauty of it is, friend, that the, the simplicity of the gospel is deeper than any teaching you'll ever receive anywhere. You know, he was crucified. He bled. He died. That's the gospel. He wants you to repent of your sins and live for him. People go, yeah, yeah, I know that, but let's talk about the book of Daniel. Why talk about the book of Daniel if you're into pornography? Why, you know, why uncover the truth of Revelation if you're going to hell, friend? Get to the simplicity of the gospel. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Boy, that's simple. That's why he came. That's why he died. A few easy to understand points concerning these scriptures. Many are called, but few are chosen. Number one is this. Everyone, say that with me, everyone is called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
everyone within the sound of my voice. Pat, Chris, Larry, you're called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can run all the days of your life. You can be sitting in the chapel tonight and feel like, well, I'm just here to pass the time of day. No, friend, you're here because God's brought you into this place and he wants to talk to you. He wants you to be in relationship with him. That's the reason you were created. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but it's long-suffering to us, not wishing that any should perish, but that some should come to repentance. Oh. I must have one of them newfangled versions. <laughs> not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance is what the Word says. That's everybody. That means, friend, everyone within the sound of my voice can be saved. Had a man in my office the other day, right here in the back, and he said, I just believe, I, I believe I've committed the unpardonable sin. I go, nay, ain't no way. No way. He sat there with tears in his eyes, going after God with all his heart. You ain't a man that's committed the unpardonable sin that ain't going to sit in my office and cry and want Jesus to be revealed in his life. So quit making yourself out to be so bad. Okay, if you're so bad out there, okay, just so bad, God will never forgive me. Friend, you wouldn't be here if God wasn't going to forgive you. And I mean that with all my heart. And theologians, you can take it to the bank. I mean that. Everyone in this place, I believe God brought you here to get a hold of you. You're not that far gone. Everybody can be saved. We should have learned that from last night's baptism. Remember the Muslim? Okay, he got saved one, two, three days ago. Got saved on Wednesday night, and he's testified last night in the baptism. He could not believe that God loved him, that Jesus wanted him. Got miraculously saved at the revival. Well, you're not supposed, that's not supposed to happen to Muslims. They're not supposed to get saved. You know, they're, they've been taught against Christianity. No, friend, God will get a hold of the Muslims. He'll get a hold of the Buddhists. He'll get a hold of anyone that is opening up their heart for the gospel. Everybody. Now, let me just give you some scriptures here. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. That's Revelation 22, 17. Some of you note takers are going, Bananas, man. If I don't give you the scripture, I see it come over your face. You're grieved. You go home incomplete. <laughs> I got a call from a man in my office several months ago, and I'd preached a message, and he called panicky, you know, and he called me at the office. I thought the guy was suicidal or something. He was going, Brother Steve, I'm so glad I reached you. Listen, I was there last night. What was point two? <laughs> I can imagine the guy tossing and turning all night long. Point two, point two, what was point two? <laughs> What was point two, God? I'm incomplete. I'm unfinished. I'm not ready for heaven. What was point two? <laughs> Matthew 11:28 28 says, Come unto me, some of you that labor and are heavy laden. No, sir. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 3, 16. Does anybody know it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jeremiah 18, 11, Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Romans 10, 11, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I haven't done this in a long time, but I'm going to do it tonight. This is for those of you that are out there that just believe, you still believe that you don't fit, okay? Everybody fits. And as this revival cranks on, friend, it is amazing how many people fit. I mean, we've had multi-millionaires, we've had billionaires come in this place, we've had congressmen. The other day a senator came down to the altar and got right with God. We've had every kind of person. We've had, 
This week we've had several prostitutes give their lives to God. We had a prostitute and, and a pimp down here last night giving their lives to God. We've had stuff happen, friend. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. We had a man of several months ago come in on a freight train from California. A hobo comes in on a freight train and he's sitting down at some, some sandwich shop and, and some people from the revival go by there and talk to him, bring him to the revival, get saved, friend. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How many believe that? Let me tell you who the whosoever's are. That's everybody. That's anybody. That's everyone. That's him, her, them, they, those, me, you, us, ourselves, themselves, youans. <laughs> Y'all. I love that sister that testified the other day from the baptismal pool. I know you're probably still here, sister. And she goes, God will deliver you from alcohol. I just, I love, I love this revival, man. I mean, they're from the north, south, east, and west. They're from everywhere. Ewans, y'all, usins. We, weans, you guys. <laughs> Everybody, friend, you guys, all, each person, that individual, all the people, kids, adolescents, old folks, young folks, city slickers, farm boys, homeboys, hamburger flippers, ice cream dippers. If you'll stick with me just for a minute, friend, you're in here somewhere. And, uh, and I want to say something. I should have done this a few minutes ago. Those of you that are translating, forget it. Just... <laughs> See, in the back, we got a back room with all these translators, okay, and they're trying to speak into this system, and all these people from other languages are listening to it. Put it in park <laughs> for about five minutes, because you're wasting your time on this one, friend. Homeboys, hamburger flippers, ice cream dippers, teeter-totter riders, fearless skydivers, short order cooks, and collectors of books, smart people that teach and mooches that leech. Michiganders from Kalamazoo and citizens of Timbuktu, butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. You can be big, small, tall, short, full-headed, gray-headed, ball-headed, headed for ball-headed. <laughs> I just saw several people going. <laughs> Big bone, medium bone, small bone, blonde hair, black hair, red hair, green hair, gross hair. <laughs> Friend, we've laid, some, we've, laid, we've laid these hands on some people, I'm telling you. <laughs> and we, we love on everybody, you know, and some folks come in here all nice and groomed, you know, and just cleaned up. But then you'll have some scuzzles come right off the street, you know, you lay your hands on their head. <laughs> it's like, oh! You know. Try to get it off the head. <laughs> Gross hair, red, yellow, black, or white, you are precious in his sight. Yeah. Hallelujah. You can be, you can be sort of bad. You can be sort of bad, sort of real bad, really bad, bad, bad as a bad or king of bad. You can live uptown, downtown, out of town, suburbs, big house, small house, no house, jail house, little house on the prairie, penthouse in Pittsburgh, or the days in and downtown Dayton. You can be from West Africa, Australia, Ireland, Japan, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, South Korea, Virgin Islands, Canada, Scotland, Norway, Italy, or Bobo, Alabama. And you folks that are traveling from other cities, don't you make fun of West Florida. We got some strange town here. We got like two egg, all right? But you got some strange towns where you come from too, so don't come down here and make fun of us. You can play the banjo or be named Joe and play in a band. You can be so smart that you can say the ABCs backwards or be so backward you never learn the ABCs. <laughs> You can hold the Guinness Book of World Records for eating the most live slugs or have a collection of the world's most colorful bugs. You can be visiting the revival like everybody oughta or come walking off the streets from Boston just to get a drink of water.
I know there's some critics here tonight. I can feel this, man. They're going, oh, well, this is a repentance revival. Whoa, man. They're moaning and groaning here tonight. Friend, let me tell you something. Bubba, let me tell you something. You slip into one meeting to get your analysis of the Brownsville Revival. We've been here since Father's Day, 1995. We've been here since when the power came down and swept people off their feet, moanings and groanings and sinners being carried from their pews and dumped at the altars, weeping. They couldn't even walk. Carried down from the balcony, people weeping and wailing. We've had times where the power of God would come down. People have screamed out in the congregation. We've had times where the ushers had to hold the sinners back because I wasn't given the altar call yet. They would literally hold them back from getting saved. So don't come in here and go, well, bunch of, this is a bunch of hogwash. No, you stick around just for a minute. God's got a plan. And besides that, Bubba, you're in here somewhere. Stick with me. I'm, I'm going to touch the Bubba's before too long. There's a Bubba right down here. I see that. You can make your living churning delicious homemade butter or spend every day collecting cans in the city gutter. You can play the guitar and be an international star or be a clown in a circus driving the world's smallest car. You can be the tidiest person this world has ever known or live like a pig with garbage in your home. Ooh. <laughs> huh. That's Bubba. <laughs> Got you, Bubba. <laughs> Bubba, how long does it take you to find your telephone? Where is that thing? Sitting underneath the bologna sandwich between the seats of your couch? <laughs> See, God loves you. He's speaking to you tonight. You can keep up with the Joneses or be the Joneses housekeeper or maybe the coolest dude in school with the largest fluorescent beeper. You can smell like Chanel and live like a queen or make your abode in an alley wearing tattered Levi jeans. You can drive a BMW and wear flashy Italian suits or ride an Appaloosa and sport pointed cowboy boots. You can be a shepherd from the hills or a pusher of pills, a wise man from afar or a soap opera star. You can be a Methodist from Montana or a Jew from Japan, be a vegetarian from Virginia or a a sewer of spam. You can come from Texas in a Lexus. You can come from Texas in a Lexus with spurs on your heels or be a fly fisherman from Frankfurt with 15 shiny reels. You can be a snot from the south, a nerd from the north, look like a beast from the east, or be the best of the west. You can be a pastor in a revival laying on the floor or, or a scared deacon from Denver running out the door. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference if you're happy or you're blue. Just call upon the Lord, whosoever, that's you. Glory. Glory. Anybody? 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 Anybody can be saved. Anybody can be set free. Anybody can be washed. Woo. Glory. Woo. Shh, man. Woo. Friend, anybody. I've been all around this world, friend. It's amazing how this gospel works. You don't have to understand the culture. You can be preaching in the streets of some foreign land and not know anything about their culture and preach the same gospel that I'm preaching here tonight. And you'll see people up in their houses waving at you. They'll come down the stairways. They'll get saved. They'll come out in the city parks, give their life to Jesus. Friend, it's for everybody. Well, let me get a little bit deeper here with you. Number two, my first point was this. What was the first point? Everyone is called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Second point is simpler than the first. Many people are not going to be saved. Now, see, that's a factoid, okay? Many people are not going to be saved. Get it through your head. I want everyone to be saved. I want everyone to be saved. But many people are not going to be saved. Want to know why? 
They choose. They choose not to be chosen. They make up their mind that they don't want to be saved. They neglect God's salvation. See, it doesn't hinge on anything Jesus has done. He has done it. Now it's up to you. I want you to bring that ball out here, Charlie, if you got it. Let me give you a simple Saturday night illustration. Now, this is a big tennis ball. <laughs> I remember I was down around um, Wall Street in New York City, and I was walking down the Soho district, and, uh, and I looked up at the store, and it said, everything big. And I went, what? You, it, New York, get anything in New York, all right? There's probably a store, everything small, but this is everything big. And I walked out there, and the first thing I saw was a pencil that went all the way to the ceiling. <laughs> and a notebook pad, as big as a pencil. And I felt like I was, you know, honey, we shrunk the kid type of thing. And I, I walked around that place, and everything was huge. I looked at this ball. This is the only thing I could afford in that place. The tennis racket, <laughs> the tennis racket that went with it was mammoth. But I couldn't carry it on an airplane, so... I got the ball. Let me explain something to you. Jesus Christ has done his part. God sent his son, born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Ghost. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. This is King James, King Jamesites and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me tell you what happened, friend. Jesus did his part. He did his part, and from the cross, he did this. He threw the ball. He threw it at you, friend. It's in your court. It's up to you now. What are you going to do with it? He threw it to you. It's in your court. What are you going to do with it? Tonight, the gospel is being thrown right into your face. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to run? Are you going to jump? Are you going to run out of the building? Are you going to freak out? Or are you going to catch it and go, Jesus, I recognize that you have done your part. I recognize that, Jesus. You have done your part. How about it, friend? Now, I know, I know this is extremely simple for some of us in this room, but it needs to be. Because on October 28, 1975, a preacher came into my house. I was a drug addict. I was a mess. This was 22 years ago. And that preacher sat at the edge of my bed. And he said, Steve, I can't help you. This preacher's going to be here this week. He's arriving on Monday, Lutheran vicar. He said, I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. His name is Jesus, and he can set you free. I sat there listening, and that preacher was doing this, spiritually speaking. This is what he's doing, tossing that ball. He said, Steve, pray with me. And I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, that's okay. Just say the name Jesus. The preacher stopped. He said, I said, say the name Jesus. And he goes like this. I caught that ball. I went, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, see, the ball was in my court. It was in my court. It was my point in time to be chosen. It was my time to recognize that Jesus Christ had done the work on Calvary for Steve Hill. The Lutheran vicar, he was saved. He was on fire for God. He was going to heaven, but Steve Hill wasn't. It was up to me to decide, was I going to receive it? Was I going to accept what this man was saying? The ball was tossed to me, and some of you, I'm telling you here tonight, that ball has been tossed to you a hundred times. You've dropped it. You've ignored it. You've done everything but caught it. I said, Jesus. And on that day, I went, Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus, and I embrace the gospel. I embrace the truth. I said, Jesus, Jesus, and the power of God. So, friends, some of you have heard the testimony swept over my body. He's cleansed me. He washed me. He made me new. And I remember the day, friend, I chose. See, Jesus was beaten. He was whipped. He was cursed. He was spat upon. They ripped his beard. They humiliated him. Who slapped you, Jesus? Let me tell you something about Jesus. He knew who slapped him. He knew where the man lived. He knew how much money the man had had in his bank account. He knew everything about the man. But Jesus just stood there. He knew everything. He's always known it all, friend. He was humiliated. A crown of thorns was pressed on his head. Bleeding, blood dripping into his eyes, stinging. Then he was stripped of his garments and whipped from the nap of his neck to his buttocks. Ripped apart by a, by a whip that had bones and glass attached to it. Ripped him to shreds. See, it wasn't our turn yet. It put a beam on his shoulder. They said, boy, you drag that thing up to that skull-looking mountain, you hear me? We're going to kill you. And on he goes. And there's some ladies along the way weeping for him. He looks at them, he goes, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. This is a lot deeper than just me. He makes it up to Golgotha's hill. They take the last stitch of clothing off of him, strip him naked. And he's laid out on the cross. They pierce his hands. They pierce his feet. They put him on the hill on top of Mount Calvary for everyone to stare at. I'm preaching to you the gospel. Are you listening? This man that America abuses, this man that tonight in the bar rooms, his name is being used as a curse word. This man hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said many things from the cross. He turned to John and said, John, your mama, mama, your son, taking care of family business, always caring for people. And one of the last things he said was this. He said, it is finished. He threw, he threw the ball, friend. He tossed it into our court. See, that was all he could do. Greater love has no man than this, than he give his life for his friends. There's nothing more a man can give but his blood, his flesh, his own very life. He did it all. He paid the ultimate price. And at the end, he said, it's over, man. Catch. And the centurion, surely this man was the son of God. The Bible records that everyone that was present began beating their breasts. As they saw him crucified, the Bible also records that the, the rocks began to split open. There was a major earthquake. People started rising from the dead. The veil in the temple, like the brother was talking about tonight, ripped open. People were going, dear God, what have we done? Jesus, take the ball, boy. Take the ball. It's in your court. What am I going to do with Jesus, Pilate said, and I say the same thing to you, friend. See, a lot of people are going to choose not to be chosen. They're going to choose not to be saved. They're going to make a decision on the face of this earth over some idiotic excuse like, well, my wife's not saved or my husband's not saved, or I work in a beer factory. If I get saved, what's going to happen to my job? Friend, you'd be better off shoveling manure in a barn in the backside of a, the hill country of Pennsylvania making minimum wage and going to heaven than be working for Anheuser-Busch, making a six-figure salary, poisoning America and going to hell in the process.
Tell you what, God's rearranging some people in this place. I can feel it. Don't get me started on this subject, friend. See, I've got friends who have left everything. Don't talk to me about money, okay? Don't talk to me about security. But I'm way up in the business of this tobacco. I'm way up in the business of this, way up in the business of that. Don't get me started on it, friend. I can show you people that were going to be multimillionaires. They were going to be, they had all the money in the world. They left it all. Why? They just sort of loved Jesus. They decided to live for Jesus. I can take you to people that are making six-figure salaries. Now they're making 42000 38000 Why? Because the six figures they were making was crummy. It was dirty money. And every time they passed a graveyard, every time they saw a funeral, every time they saw a car in a parking lot that was smashed to, to, and shredded to bits, they would think about the job that they have and they'd say, man, did I cause that? Is that part of my labor? Yeah, it's all about choices, friend. Somebody's getting mad at me. I can feel this. Getting mad at me. Go ahead. I tell you what, what you need to do in everything, friend, in everything, get on your face before the Lord. Okay? In everything. Don't lie, okay, to yourself, to God, to anybody. Get on your face, honestly, alone, and say, Jesus, are you pleased with what I do with my life right now? Are the things I'm living for worth you dying for? That's Leonard Ravenhill's epitaph. Are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? Ask yourself. Don't be afraid to ask that question, friend. If you're afraid to ask that question, there's something wrong with you. You're afraid God will move you away from that. You're afraid he might say, no, I'm not pleased. Thanks for asking. I'd like to move you. I'd like to change you. I'd like to give you a respectable job. This ain't part of my notes, but boy, this is going somewhere. Those of you that are musicians, you make your money. I have met in my life so many two-faced musicians. They're nauseating to me. They'll play in church on Sunday and in bars on Friday nights. And they call it making a little extra money for the family. Get real, friend. God's bigger than that. God's bigger than you going down to some honky-tonk and watch half-dressed women dancing all over the place in front of you and you call yourself a Christian. I don't know, friend, who's in this place that needs to hear this. But you want the blessings of God? Abstain from all appearance of evil. All appearance of it, friend. Flee it. Put God to the test. Say, Jesus, I'm leaving this junk. Matter of fact, my guitar is going in the closet. If you don't want me to play guitar in, in the church, that's fine, but I sure ain't going to play it for the devil. But let me close on this point. A lot of people are not going to be saved. The ball is going to be tossed into their court. It's their move. There's a lot of people that just don't want to play ball with God. Just don't want to play ball with God. Absolute rejection. Their heart is set on sin. They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I'm working on a message on that right now, friend. What it means to be a lover what it means to be a lover of pleasure, what it means to be a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. It's shocking, friend. See, everyone looked this way in the chapel also, those of you at home. It's reevaluation time for everybody. I'm talking about myself, okay? That everything in our lives, friend, everything has got to be fine-tuned. Is anybody listening? And I daily go through this. Is there anything that we're doing that does not glorify the Lord? In the ministry, are we doing things just to do things? Somebody came up to me a few minutes ago and said, how much does it cost to start an orphanage? Okay, in a foreign country. And I said, a lot of money. He said, 100000 I said, yeah, at least 100000 but that's just the beginning. How about keeping it going afterwards? It's major effort, major work. 
People have come to me all over the place and asked me questions like that. What will it take for a feeding program? What will it take for this? What will it take for that? Make sure God's speaking to you about things like that. Because what we do is we, we, we build so much junk around us, and it's called our ministry. And the Lord's looking at it. We never look to the Lord of the harvest. We never look to the Lord of the harvest and ask Him what He wanted us to do. We just found a little you know, niche, and we thought, well, that'll look cool. That looks cool. I'll do that. I have people come to me all the time, and they go, I want to go here. I want to go there. I want to go to the mission field. You people from the school, listen to me. The mission field is not what you think. A, a two-week visit to the mission field is the same as going to Disney World. The same thing. You'll go cry. You'll get a little thrill. You'll lead people to Jesus. It's wonderful, just like Disney World. But when you go back, if you lived in Disney World or something, you'll get sick of it. You go back to the mission field and live there. Nobody's there no more. Mike Brown's not there no more. Your supporters already forgot you. They're not sending you money no more. You're over there and you got $10 in your pocket. You're living in a tent. And you lived in a tent, I mean, maybe when you were on your little missions trip, but now you're really living in the tent. And people ask you about your future and you freak. My future, I'm here. Here. Friend, it's a whole different ball game. And I hear people in the Bible school, friend, uh, young people, I love you dearly, but don't come up to me with this missions call and then three years from now be squalling from the mission field. You go to the mission field, go like an army man. Go like a military man. You go there and maybe pack your stuff in a casket because maybe you're never coming back. But don't come with this business of, well, I think I'll just go over there for a little while. If it doesn't work out, I'll go to India. If that doesn't work out, I'm going to try Argentina and I'm just going to be a tourist. The mission field is sick of tourists. When I was in Russia, they told me, keep Americans out of here. They come over here and one of the leaders, and the Pentecostal leader said, all you North Americans do is rape us. You rape us. You come over here and spiritually rape our nation. You hand out thousands of tracts, you hold meetings, and everybody comes to them because you're a novelty. And then you take all your pictures, all your movies, you get on your plane, and you raise all your money in America, and you leave us devastated. But you know what people call that? I'm going to Russia on a missions trip. I'm going to Russia on a missions trip. Let me mind you, mind you of something, friends. Some of those people you lead to Jesus never get grounded. They have a bad experience because Jesus came and left their lives through you. They have a bad experience. They're never discipled. You're long gone. You're back in Minneapolis having the time of your life. They're back in Russia trying to figure out what was that? What was that blur? What was that whirlwind that came through here? And then what do they do? They backslide. And then some good God-fearing pastor from the city who's really doing a nitty-gritty work in town goes door to door and knocks on their door and says, listen, I want to present to you Jesus Christ. And the girl goes, oh, I've done that. I've been, I've got saved, yeah. Some North Americans came through here three months ago. I gave my heart to God. It just, I don't want anything to do with that no more. Is anybody listening? Reevaluate everything. People call me almost every day. They say, do you have any money, Brother Steve? I want, to go to, I want to go to Ecuador. My first question is, why? I want to go down there and win them to Jesus. How long are you going to be gone? Six days. Now, I have nothing against short-term trips, friend, but they better be involved. They better be around local churches. They better be in a place where you're going to disciple, raise them up. When your little whirlwind team pulls out, there better be a group of people that was working with you that can disciple all those new converts. If not, friend, it's a joke. It's a joke. Man, I don't know. Struck a chord with me on that one, friend. Others that aren't going to be saved, they found an easier way. 
They've learned how to recite a few creeds, partake of the ordinance of the church, communion, water baptism. Let a man of the cloth mumble a little prayer over them, and you're saved, you're fine. Your sins are forgiven. No, friend, that's not what Jesus was talking about when he tossed you the ball. It's a whole lot more than that. But they're not going to be saved, friend, because of some lukewarm religion out there. I don't want to play ball with Jesus because it costs too much. Hanging out with Jesus messes up my social life. Others don't want to go through suffering. Everyone look this way. You don't want to go through suffering. I'm going to tell you, living for Jesus, you'll go through some stuff, man. If you're going to live for Jesus, you should pattern yourself after what Jesus went through. Okay? I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Oh, then you're going to have some Judases in your life then. You're a Christian, then you're willing to spend 40 days in fastings and prayer. Oh, you're a Christian, you're willing to be tempted of the devil. You're a Christian, you're ready, to people, you're ready for people to mock you and, and make fun of you and scourge you. Are you ready for people to, to curse at you? So you're a Christian. See, it means something different than what we use it as, friend. But they don't want to go through suffering. They catch the ball. They receive Jesus in their heart. And as soon as something comes along that bothers them, they drop the ball. They go, Jesus, come on now, Jesus. Surely you're not talking about that. He begins speaking to them about sin. They run for cover. They don't want to be exposed. Let me tell you something about God's alteration shop, friend. How many knows that God's in the tailoring business? He, he, can, he, he is... He is in the business of working on us. How many would agree with that? But let me tell you how. Now, he's going to make a garment for you. It's called the robe of righteousness. Okay? The robe of righteousness. But God never makes the robe of righteousness to fit the man. He always makes the man to fit the robe of righteousness. Don't ever forget that about God's tailors. He's a fine tailor. But he never, ever makes a robe of righteousness to fit you. You're big, full of sin, fat in the things of the world, so God makes a big robe for you? No, friend. He whittles away at you. He puts you on the treadmill. He gets you going. He gets that fat off of you, that junk off of you, and you'll slim down. And then you go, good, now it fits. But boy, people start getting under God's Measuring tape, they drop the ball. Well, my last point tonight is this. What's the first point? Second point? That's not, that's not a negative point, friend. That's a factual point. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. There's a lot of people, friend, that are just going to plain old go to hell. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. The excuses, the reasoning for going to hell, it's all a joke, friend. You'll be like the rich man who died screaming out to Abraham, send someone down just to touch my lips with a drop of water. It'll be so foolish to you, the reasons for not living for Jesus. Number three, tonight you can choose to be chosen. Tonight you can choose to be chosen. You can be one of the chosen few. Are they listening in the chapel, Richard? Good. Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, John 15, 16, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You can choose, friend. Like I made a choice 22 years ago, you can choose tonight to take this ball you can take it in your hands and say, Jesus, I take a choice. I'm going to play ball with you for the rest of my life, Jesus. I've caught it. I'm going to keep it. We can toss it back and forth if you want, but I'm playing ball with you. It's up to you, friend. It's up to you. 
I remember one of my friends right after I got saved, and I'm closing in just a few minutes. He came up to me, and he said, Steve, he said, I just can't do it. He got saved in jail. He said, I just can't live the life. And I was standing there with the ball, man. I was living for Jesus. I was so happy. I got so fanatical about Jesus. I got so saved. Like Mike Brown, you know, he, he went from um, what Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix to uh, Make Me a Blessing, you know. I did the same thing, friend. All the, all the albums, all the, I had them all, the Stones, Jethro Tull, all that kind of stuff. When I got saved, I was so on fire for God. I destroyed everything I had. And I remember somebody gave me a, a tape of, uh, who was it, Evie Tornquist. And uh, the song Born Again, you know. And here I was, a heavy rocker, a doper, you know, coming right out of the drug, you know, just a gutter rat. Okay, always listening to raunch music, okay? Love the heavy acid rock music. Now I'm walking around going, born again, there's really been a change in me. Born again, just like Jesus said. Born again. One of my friends came over to my house. <laughs> they came over to my house, man, and Jim, I'll never forget this, man. You know, it was, it was a girl, and I'll tell you what, she, she laughed at me because I said, I want you to hear this, you know? And I'd, already, I'd, already pl I'd always played music, you know, in my room and stuff like that. And I put on that song, Born Again. She sat there and went, what? That's not even music. It was music to me. <laughs> I'd been changed by the blood of the Lamb. I was brand new. I was playing ball. Jesus. Brand new. Whew. You can choose, friend. Whew. How many want me to throw this ball to him? <laughs> but my friend, he said, yeah. He said, have, have them sit down. Have them sit down, ushers. He said, ushers, where are you? Ushers, sit the man down. This young man, look this way, folks. This is revival. Stuff happens all the time, okay? Get used to it, okay? We've had people, some, the other night a man just stood up in the back and cussed me out, you know, just cussed me out, you know, and whatever. And I didn't even, some, somebody said, he said he hates your suit. And, uh, and I don't know what he was saying, you know, he's just cussing me out. Then they dragged him out of here and we went on. And another guy the other day just stood up right there, go, starts going, rah, 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 and it's something about politics, you know, and so you drag him out too, and whatever. But this friend, he saw that I'd been so changed, and he said, Steve, I can't do that. See, I had chosen to be chosen. Are you listening? I had chosen to be chosen. I wanted Jesus in my heart. I wanted to change. But he was not ready for change. And I went on into Teen Challenge, and I was in Jim Summers' program. And I don't know if you remember this young man named Scott, but uh, I got a phone call. It may have been you, Jim, that called me. And Scott, who chose not to be chosen, when continue on into drugs, he was one of the dealers in the city. And another friend of mine went over to his house, and Scott had been working in the wrong territory of the city, dealing, dr dealing drugs. Another friend of mine went over to his house, put enough morphine in a needle to kill an animal, and, and just gave it to Scott. He said, Scott, here, I want to turn you on to some dope. And he pushed the dope into Scott's arm. The police called it, they called it uh, overdose. But it was a hot shot, friend. He, they killed him. Put him out of his misery, you know, just put him out of the business t totally. And the police show up, overdose, he's gone. How sad. Same opportunity. The Lord tossed him the ball. And he had turned to me, he said, Steve, I just can't do that. He said, I can't play ball, is what he's saying. I can't play ball with Jesus. And now he's six foot under, friend. You know, it reminds me of a scripture. 
The disciples said to Jesus, And we believe and we're sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. I've chosen you, but one of you is a devil. You know what that is, friend? That's that choice in life all the way through. It's been a decision from the beginning of my life. Some of you, time gets a little hard and you turn on Jesus. Things don't work out the way they're going to work out. You know what you do? You take the ball, you throw it back in his face, and you say, I'm going home. I'm not playing ball with you no more, Jesus. You said you'd take care of all my needs. I'm more in debt now than ever before. You said you'd do this for me, Jesus. I wanted to get married. And yet you have not brought me a spouse. You have not, I'm going to go out and find my own husband. I'm going to go out and find my own wife. Jesus, you said you'd do this for me. You said you'd heal me. And I'm not healed, Jesus. You take the ball. You throw it back in his face. See, that's why Jesus, Judas turned on Jesus, because all his dreams were not realized. See, Judas, that's why he was dipping into the bag. Why? What can I get out of this ministry? This is sickening. Kingdom to come. I want a kingdom now. I want my money now. Judas wanted everything now. I want a sword. I want to take over the Romans. I want it now. Judas takes the ball, throws it right back in the Lord's face. And one of you is a devil. Friend, play ball with the Lord. When he tosses that ball to you tonight, he tosses it to you. And, he, and by the way, he's got the rules of the game. He's got the rules of the game. When he tosses it to you, you choose to play ball with him. He's electing you. He's choosing you. Bible school students, this ain't a game, friend, as, a, as the world calls a game. This is serious hardball. This is a Super Bowl. And you've been chosen to play on the first string. Coach said, come on out here. Show me what you got. Boy, you better know how to pass. Everyone stand. Look this way. Those of you in the chairs, move them to the left and the right, if you would. Everyone in the chapel, stand. There's some folks under serious conviction in this place. I can feel it. I want to tell you one of the most convicting things that was said tonight is this, that many of you, the Lord has tossed you the ball, and you've dropped it. You're backslidden. You fell away from God. You said, I can't do this, Jesus. I can't operate like this, Jesus. I can't play ball with you, Jesus. You dropped. I've got good news for you, friend. Spiritually speaking, I see the Lord tossing that ball once again. He's looking straight at you. He's looking straight at you. You know what he's going to give you? Another chance. He's going to give you another opportunity to play ball with him. Many are called, but few are chosen. Be one of the chosen few. Be one of the ones that decides, I'm going to play ball with Jesus. I'm going to be right in the center court. I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. I'm going to go where Jesus wants me to go. Boy, I feel this, friend. You know, I feel some just minds clicking right now. I can almost hear the, the gears turning in some of your minds. Making up your mind tonight, I'm going to follow the Lord. You're making up your mind tonight, you're going to follow Jesus. I'm waiting for these folks to move their chairs, and we're going to have an altar call. Charity, come join me. While they're doing this, pastors, let me share something with you. I know many of you have, you're, you're here this, this night. Can I touch on something concerning distractions and revival? Now, this dear man, I don't know who he is, but God bless you, brother. I love you. If you're a brother, and if you're not a brother, I love you. But pastor, would you do your congregation a favor and take control of the services? Okay? You, I'm not talking about controlling God.
but let the people know that there's a man of an authority. I got a phone call the other day from a man out west, and he was telling me about all these problems going on in his church. And I asked him this question. I said, who's the pastor? He said, I am. And I said, it sure don't sound like it. He said, well, this member's giving me all kinds of problems. What? A member's giving you all kinds of problems? How long are you going to let them do that? And he just kept wimping out over the phone with me. I said, dear God, friend, these are sheep out there that need help. Sounds like you're dealing with a wolf. And all you little sheep are waiting for you to rise up and be a pastor. So you can't control God in the revival, okay? God's going to move in the revival, but you can sure pastor the thing. And when things go on in the services that, that are out of order, let the people know you're there, all right? Don't sit there going, God, you know, come on, just speak to me. What's going on here? No, let them, if you feel in your spirit something's not right, take care of it just like that. Let the people know someone is in charge. And I want to tell you, God will move. He'll honor you. And don't worry about making a mistake, okay? Don't worry about that. You don't second guess every decision you make. God's using you. He's called you to that position. Make a decision. Because you're going to have people come up to you, Pastor. I've had people come right up to me and say, they said things like, you miss God tonight. You know, people that are visiting. Everybody's got a word for you. I believe the service should have gone this direction. I believe the service could have gone that direction. And I'll look them straight in the face and I'll say, you're probably wrong. Okay? And if you're right, it went the direction it went. Okay? End of story. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's, yeah, that's the way it is. Do you understand me? They go, yeah, yeah, I understand, I understand. And they walk off. Trying to get an inroad, trying to build doubt. You do that, friend, God's going to move somewhere else. He's looking for somebody that'll come in and say, hey, listen, God, this is not perfect. We don't have everything polished here. These are human beings that come in from all over the countryside. Lord, we're going to do our very best. And that's all the Lord is asking of you, friend. But don't let people come in, especially if you have visitors come in from all over the place. Don't let them come in and control your services. Because we have, we have loonies that come here, friend. You know, a big light attracts a lot of bugs. And they come, and all they want to do, they want to be that little firefly in the night. You know, they want everybody to see them. And they'll stand up in the middle of the service and they'll go, Thus saith the Lord! And I'll look at them and go, Not tonight. <laughs> Not tonight. That's not where God's going with this tonight, Bubba. Sit down. And you see arrogance in people. When you see arrogance, that's a sign right there. They're not of God. You got a word for me? You better be humble. This in-your-face type of stuff, you won't get 10... 10 inches with John Kilpatrick or myself or Kerry Robinson or Mike Brown. You got a word from God, it's humble. And you also, you're from a local church, you better be from a local church or a church in this country and you better be in good standing with the church and you better be up on your tithing. Because if you ain't in good standing with the church and up on your tithing, you ain't got no business talking to us. You have nothing to say. Well, if you lay those guidelines down, Pastor, it'll help you. It'll help you. Because a lot of people are into pharisaical Christianity. They want to be noticed by everybody. They want to be noticed. That's not what this is about. This is all about Jesus being noticed. Jesus being lifted up. We're going to give an altar call. Say that with me. Altar call. This is an altar down here, okay? This is where people come. And, and uh, one of these days, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to have my staff come in and we're going to take carpet samplings and uh, scrape this carpet. I'm going to send it off to laboratories. I'm going to do this. I'm going to send it off to scientific laboratories and I want them to analyze all the DNA samples, all the hair samples, all the tear, the dry tears. Friend, could you imagine what they will come up with under those microscopes. 1,700,000 people have been here. It's in the carpet. I don't care how you clean it, friend, it's there. It's there. And people have come from all over the world down to this altar and wept tears of repentance. They've come from Korea, Japan, England. They've come from Minneapolis. They've come from 
Tucson. They've come from all over the world. Some of you have come from across town tonight. You're going to come down here. You're going to get right with God. You're going to make a decision. Before this year goes any further, you're going to make a decision. You're going to follow Jesus all the days of your life. He's going to toss you that ball tonight, and you're never, ever again going to drop it. You're going to say, Jesus, you've chosen me. I choose you. I'm going to go with you, Jesus. This is how this works. Charity is going to sing Mercy Seat. Anyone in this room that has sin in their life, that means anything between you and Jesus. You're going to hit these altars when she begins to sing. Don't come before that. Wait till she begins. Anyone in the chapel, as soon as Charity begins to sing, you're going to come quickly down to the altar. You're going to get right with God. You're going to get the sin out. That's why some of you have dropped the ball because he dealt with you about sin. Now he's going to pick it back up and throw it back in your face and you're going to deal with it tonight. You're going to deal with it. You're going to get the sin out. If you're doing things that Jesus would never do, you're going to come down to this altar. If you can sit in front of a television set and watch a woman take her clothes off or a man take his clothes off, you're in sin. A Christian would never do that, period. I saw a lot of heads drop just then. A lot of heads just drop. That's too strict, Steve. No, friend. No, friend. If you think it's okay to watch that on television, next time, why don't you pray over it? Why don't you say, Jesus, come into my, my room. Have a seat with me, Jesus, here on my bed. Have a seat here on the couch. I want you to watch this program with me, Jesus. If you think drinking is just fine, why don't you ask the Lord's blessing before you drink? How come in the bars tonight they're not all going, let's bow in prayer? Why, friend? They know it ain't God. They know it's poison. They know it's wrong. No matter how sh they shout and curse at you, they know it's wrong deep down inside. And you know it's wrong. You're doing stuff that Jesus would never do. I want you to come to this altar in just a minute and repent. You're backslidden. You've drifted away from God. You're going to come forward, friend, and get right with God, and you're going to do it quickly. Friend, don't do this business tonight going back and forth. Thursday night was the largest, one of the largest altar calls in the history of the revival. We've had large ones, but what happened? People came to the altar quickly. They came to the altar quickly. Do that tonight. Come quickly if God's dealing with your heart. Those of you that have never known the Lord, how about it? Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. He'll come into your life. He'll change you. He'll make you brand new. He'll give you a reason to live. You'll wake up tomorrow morning. You'll pinch yourself, friend. You'll be so happy. I know what I'm talking about. I get tear-stained letters in the mail from people that have been saved at the Brownsville Revival. Most of the letters start out like this, forgive me for going so long, you know, but I want to tell you my story. And here it goes, page after page after page after page. And at the end of the letter, they're so happy. They're so happy because they did what you're about to do. They came down here, got right with God. Those of you that have never known the Lord, you're going to come quickly. And those of you in this room and in the chapel that are religious, but you don't know Jesus, I hurt for you, friend. See, tomorrow morning is a scary day on my calendar. It's Sunday morning in America. And as much as you might not understand this, give yourself a try, friend. Try to understand it, that the devil works overtime on Sunday morning, not keeping people from church. He works overtime getting people to church. The devil and his demons do everything they can on Sunday morning to get people to church, and I want to tell you why. They know if they can get America to go inside those stained glass windows for an hour, that America will feel like they're okay. They'll scratch their spiritual itch. And I promise you, the devil will do everything he can to keep America going to church on Sunday morning because they feel like that's their little religious duty. And they sit out there and, and the church can be full of sin. The pastor knows it. But the people will never come back on Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night prayer meetings. Just Sunday morning. Why? Because it never gets deep. It never gets deep on Sunday morning. It's sort of a surface thing. And some of the folks never get outside the parking lot before they're already cursing their wives and kids. Can't wait to get home. Why? To watch a ball game and pop the top of a few six-packs. 
It's sad, friend. That's America in a nutshell. And if you don't believe that, then you live a blinded life. So if you're religious, I love Sunday mornings, friend, but I want to see Sunday mornings change across America. Don't ever forget, this revival broke out on a Sunday morning. It went till 4.30 that afternoon. And then it started back at 6 and went till 3 in the morning. And we've been here ever since. God whipped us silly one Sunday morning. It was Father's Day. <laughs> he came down. He said, I think I'll visit. <laughs> I think I'll go to church. And boy, the devil had gotten a lot of people to church that morning. The devil had no idea what was about to happen. Boy, he met, a, he met his match. So tonight I want to ask you, are you infatuated with Jesus? Are you in love with him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? If you don't, friend, I question your salvation. If you're one of those that can sing and clap and jump for joy in church, but you can't pray in a restaurant, I question your salvation. If you're ashamed of him at Shoney's or ashamed of him at Red Lobster or ashamed of him at McDonald's, but in church, boy, you can sing with the best of them, something's wrong with you, friend. If you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. You confess him, he'll confess you. Now, the only thing that's going to keep you back, boy, some of you can't look at me, man. The only thing that's going to keep you back is pride. Pride will hold you back tonight, friend. Pride will say, what's my wife going to think? What's my girlfriend going to think? What's my husband going to think? What's my pastor going to think? What's my parishioners going to think if I go forward? Who cares? We're beyond all that, friend. You'll notice here, no eyes closed, no hands raised. People come, over 300,000 people have come to these altars, friend. Be one of them. Be one of them. Who cares? And by the way, it's, isn't it sort of egotistical for you to think that everybody's thinking about you? You know? You think half the people around you are going, oh my, look, there she goes. No, they're going, Jesus, you want me to go down there? Do you want me to go down there? They're, I mean, they're not thinking about you, friend. They're, in, you're, they're doing this number, okay? Trust me, okay? And if you go down there, they're going, they're going, man, maybe I should go down too. Maybe that is a sin in my life, you know? Lord, is it really that big of a sin, the pornography I'm involved in? Is, that, is it that bad? The answer is yes. Charity is going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who needs forgiveness, everyone who's away from God, everyone who's never known the Lord, everyone who wants to choose to be chosen, I want you to come right now. Step out right now. Hurry. Get down here. Hurry. Let's go. I need the Lord. I need forgiveness. Come on down from the balcony. In the chapel. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get on your face before the Lord. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Friend, we're not going to waste time. Come on, come on, come on down. Here's what we're going to do. Go ahead and repent. Get right with God. Stay right where you're at at these altars. But we're not going to waste time tonight, friend. I'm not going to let the devil have one inch in your life. If you know you're supposed to be down here, get down here right now. And I want to tell you something else. If there is somebody... I want everyone to turn to the person next to them and ask them, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? In the balcony, do it. Down here, do it. And when someone asks you that question, do not lie. Tell them the truth. And then both of you come down together. Both of you come down together. Sing it again, Charity. Hurry, 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 hurry. Come on, hurry, hurry. Bring them with you right now. Bring them with you right now. Come on. If you need to be down here, come on right now. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. In the darkness. Hurry. Where everything is unknown. Come on. I face the power. Come on.
chosen tonight? Have you made up your mind to follow Jesus? He's tossing you the ball. Are you going to catch it? He's tossing it into your face. Are you going to catch it? Decide right now, friend. It's up to you to be saved. It's up to you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Quit looking at all the people around you and look inside. Ask the Lord right now to wash you, to cleanse you, to forgive you, to make you new. Come on, friend. Right now. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, Where hope come on, I see you, ma'am, I see you, sister, Lost come on, in the curse come on, let's go, let's go, lovely illusions, they never come true, but I know where there's I know a place, a place of mercy, of mercy. Because every, everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Don't move at the altar. God's